Hey, this is Christian Buckley with another MVP Buzz Chat, and I'm here this morning with Reza. Hey, good to see you. Hey, Christian, good to see you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, so for folks that don't know you, who you are, where you are, what you do, why don't you give us an introduction? Sure. Uh, I'm Reza Red. I'm based in New Zealand, uh, the other side of the world for most of people. <laughs> uh, and I'm a, uh, I'm a data platform MVP from from the time that it was more like, let's say, focused on SQL Server, my activities was like BI related. These days is uh, more like Power BI, uh, the BI part of uh, data platform uh, Power BI. And I'm also a regional director. Uh, I do consulting and training on Power BI a lot, pre-COVID-19, speaking in many conferences. Yeah. Uh, these days, speaking as well, but mostly to my camera. Yeah, online. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's, it's a, an interesting transition to, to, to that. But, uh, you know, something that's interesting, though, you know, folks that I know that are on, that are like Power BI experts, you really see kind of a, a split of their MVP focus for those that are MVPs. And I know that there are RDs that cover multiple tops as well, but you see MVPs that specialize in Power BI that are um, business applications MVPs. Um, office development MVPs and data platform. Uh, I, is, is there a yeah. difference between those? I mean, because I look at it from the outside as a non-developer, I'm an office yes. apps and services MVP, focused on productivity. My primary customers that I work with are business users. It's more of the user experience and that the front of the office. Um, yes. And, and so what's the difference between, uh, you know, the M MVPs within those focus areas if I look at it, it's like, y'all kind of do the same thing. <laughs> mm, yeah. The, the thing is that like, uh, like Power BI uh, formally is under the data platform category. However, right. because it is related to many other things, it is related to dynamics. You see business application MVPs focusing on that. We have a lot of MVPs who came from like Office uh, and SharePoint category also to Power BI side. Uh, we see a lot of Excel MVPs nowadays working with Power BI because it, uh, because it can like serve all of those like um, analytics need that we previously did it with Excel, with performance point in SharePoint, with um, let's say SSRs in uh, SQL Server. All of those now uh, can be done, let's say much better in Power BI. So we have like people coming from all different kind of like expertise into Power BI, which is right. quite a good, a uh, good thing to have because, for example, I'm coming from like database development background. So I know that area good uh, and I can uh, add it into my Power BI experience. Someone who comes from, let's say, SharePoint uh, has the good understanding of like the digital platform and things around it, which can help in implementing Power BI. So altogether that, that, uh, that let's say, um, collective knowledge of all of these MVPs coming from different areas and working with Power BI, I say that is a really good, good thing to have. This helps a lot in uh, adoption of Power BI. Yeah, agreed. And I think, I guess and for people that aren't that familiar with the MVP program as well, is they, they, uh, they do kind of shift like the areas of focus or the, the titles of the MVP. And that's why a lot of people just say default is like, I'm a Microsoft MVP. Uh, because the reality is that, uh, you know, you might be, focused or your MVP may have been awarded in the power platform. So a, a, you know, a business application MVP, yet you may also be a SharePoint and exchange person who also does office development. You might work for an ISV or, or a, you know, a mobile development company and are doing things in a number of different areas. So once you're in, uh, I guess it's, it's a, uh, I guess it's an important distinction. It's like once you're an MVP and you're in the, the, the program, and it's, it is an opportunity to go much more in depth and get an inside perspective on uh, many other areas as well. So Great. You, yeah. You, and, you, and we have, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And we have a lot of like dual MVPs, like people right. who are working at like across multiple things. You're seeing that more and more, in fact, yes. dual and, tri and even some triple MVPs. Yeah. Yeah. Great. 
Those are the people that have no free time. <laughs> Busy all the time. No, they're, 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 around they're, all different products. They're single. They're, they're, they're only at work. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, you've been an MVP for a few years. How many years have you been an MVP? Uh, 10 years. This year ten years became now. 10 years. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, Did you get your blue yeah. ring yet? Uh, no, I think the shipment to New Zealand takes a little bit longer time. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, in the COVID period. So it's probably on a boat. So you should get it in 12 to 18 weeks. Yeah. And we have quarantine here as well. So that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, well, that's exciting. Well, so what are some of the things that you're actively talking about and presenting on these days? Yeah. So, so as I mentioned, it's more like uh, Power BI focused. Uh, and this is like a wide range from visualization in Power BI to data modeling to data preparation, um, architecture of the whole uh, implementation, like putting different bits and pieces together, uh, how to share, let's say, um, content with the users and users or all other types of users, how to put together a self-service architecture uh, and things around it, all of that together. But what I have seen most uh, of the um, requirement is in my, let's say, consulting works and coaching works that I do for a lot of clients is that they, um, they have um, most of their needs in putting an architecture together. Let's say we want to adopt Power BI, we want to uh, implement Power BI, but we don't know, let's say, which architecture we should use. Should we use live connection? Should we have our data model in SQL Server connect to that? Or we should build everything in Power BI? What should I do with my self-service users? Things like that is one of the uh, areas that a lot of people need help, which I do as of my, like, let's say, architecture advisory things and the data modeling uh, calculation and data preparation. The visualization part is also important, but the visualization is something that uh, you get to learn it quite fast, especially the amount of um, content available in the internet, either free content like YouTube and things like that, or paid video courses. There are lots of courses, which if you just uh, go ahead and uh, go through some of those, your visualization knowledge goes up quite fast. But the other two areas, the architecture and the modeling, calculation, data preparation, uh, those uh, are, let's say, uh, it, it, it's like the iceberg need. that's that's what's underneath yeah. the water the, the, the exactly water yes. yeah. <laughs> it's a i so i've i you know, so it's i've been through because I, I have a background you know the first uh half of my career um was in the data warehousing space and worked in the telecom world worked for you know very large phone company in the u.s the formerly pacific bell lots of acquisitions that happened since then but um and doing data center consolidations and dealing with massive amounts of data is you know, people I, I think don't fully understand the uh, the, the the generous amounts of uh, data massaging that has to happen to be able to do that pretty application layer that that presentation layer of uh, you know not not that uh, Power BI is just a presentation layer. There's a lot more that it can do. It's an analytical tool, but um, but yeah, there's a lot to uh, to kind of get it to that point. I think that's it's. it's it's almost deceiving when you're watching a uh, you know a demo or something of a lot of these tools, um, and just go and connect into this data and like oh hey and I'll just point to it and click and there we are and look at that beautiful <laughs> graph. There's a little bit more that's involved there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that is mainly showing as you as you explain like the tip of iceberg, but let's say seventy percent of the things that is. Uh, under the water, uh, those are like something that people need to focus more, and those takes quite a bit of time to uh, to learn. There's a learning curve for that. Well, I, I do like how Microsoft is focusing more and more on, uh, you know, creating experiences that are uh, almost. I'm thinking of it as like. Uh, like a smorgasbord of a restaurant of options, a buffet of options um, of providing some, you know, sampling. For example, the uh, expansion of ideas in Excel is a great way for someone with zero experience with the data, but may have a fairly complex, uh, uh, you know, spreadsheet of data 
uh, at the beginning of their uh, uh, you know, data management process, but they can use ideas in Excel now and uh, it will actually leverage some of those visualization things and, and create and generate uh, like the, the starter uh, uh, you know, visualization of that data, um, which, which gives you an idea of what can be done over in Power BI. Obviously, it, you're more advanced. It's a big step up to jump from Excel to Power BI with some of those capabilities. But at least to give you an idea to start thinking about, you know, hey, this is close to the, the, you know, the, the, the graphical representation of this data that I need to see. So when we build the dashboard, this is similar to what I need to, to see. Um, I don't know if you, if you are spending a lot of time building those kinds of solutions, if you've uh, started using that with any of your clients to uh, get yes. them thinking about that. Yeah, um, um, in, my, in my, let's say, work experience, we don't really build that much of solutions, but those solutions are really helpful. Like there are lots of template apps that you can use for different, let's say, scenarios for financial scenario for different scenarios, which, which, are, which are really helpful. I've seen a lot of our clients actually go ahead and use those um, at their beginning uh, type of work and then extend it at some point area rather than reinventing the whole wheel. Um, my part when it comes to, let's say, working with clients usually comes after when they come to, let's say, customize it because then they want to do some extra analysis. They have a question in, let's say, DAX calculation or how to bring their own data combined with this data and the architecture piece, as I mentioned. So th those are things that I usually help my clients with. But those templates apps, those pre-built templates apps are definitely a great, uh, good uh, first step to get things rolling. Well, it's like, you know, I, I, one of the things that I really liked about, uh, well, let me, let me back, jump over to another idea. I'll come back to that other thought. But the, you know, one of the, um, you know, we spent so many years um, struggling with the capturing of data. And so having worked in, so my, my first 10 years of experience working in technology, um, where so much of it was about capturing that data and do we have enough storage for this? And, and we're now going to be merging these data sets and, and upgrading the hardware to be able to handle that. And then there just was this the decreasing cost of the storage. And suddenly we had the ability to inexpensively store anything and everything. And then you ha start having, uh, uh, you know, big data problems of we've got all this data, all this transactional data, this live data that's coming in. Um, and what do we actually use? What do we need? How can we better leverage this? And we are, we're coming into an era where I think more and more organizations are taking the time to think about and you know, to really look at their data assess and say, how can we better leverage this to, to, to do more, to go faster, to, 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 to decrease costs where, um, you know, it, 10, 15 years ago, I mean, we just weren't able to do, we were just trying to keep the servers and the primary systems up and running and lights on on the servers. Um, I don't know if that's, that's, if you look at the world the same way, but we just seem to be at a uh, uh, kind of a golden era for, um, you know, data analysis, certainly knowledge management, you know, my world, um, it, it feels like that. We're, we're finally able to do a lot of what we dreamed about doing 10, 15 years ago. Yes, definitely. That, that is actually a good, uh, good era of uh, data to be in, because as you mentioned, like, uh, decades ago, we had uh, scenarios of let's have this operational system, let's gather the data from, let's say, everywhere. And now we have the data. We even have, like in many scenarios that I work with clients, they have more data that they can analyze. Like they say, let's put this part of data aside, we'll just analyze this part, and then later on we'll bring that part. This means that we have like so much operational systems, so much data sets, so much databases uh, that can be analyzed, but probably like they are all scattered around. Um, uh, the, the, 
thing that we had with like master data management again a few years ago and let's say having things into let's say an enterprise data warehouse those helped to have mm -hmm. something like a solid uh, one place uh, to bring all of these things together and that helps a lot but definitely this is an era that uh, we have um, uh, we we don't have let's say that much of problem of getting the data. Data is already uh, uh, populated through different systems. We just probably need to integrate it if the integration ha haven't been done already and start analyzing it, which that analysis can be different, depends on how the data is integrated and things like that. But, but one big challenge of not having that data is already solved. Which is, which is a big uh, challenge always for the BI systems, or even for, let's say, data science systems, uh, when we talk about like finding algorithms in the data, finding patterns in the data, it is important yeah. that you have quite a lot of data right. already gathered, which is something that we already, uh, I guess, um, passed that step for many organizations. Well and it probably helps that we share that we're speaking in generalities and share some examples. Like I, I spent a few years working in the supply chain and telecommunication spaces. So you think of supply chain where you have, uh, you know, your ERP data. So all of your products, all of the components, um, it's state within the manufacturing process, logistics data, um, geographical information system data, um, like working with the phone company. We, you know, we, I did played a lot with the integrating, GIS information so that when you send people out in the field and they're digging up a cable to repair a line that they, you know, know exactly where to go to dig, uh, you know, geographically and, and, uh, but having all that information as well as, um, you know, the, your, your customer data, all their demographic, psychographic information. So you really understand your customer, what they're buying and of the products they're buying the state that they, those things are and the, the product and being built and delivered and kind of all those things, massive amounts of data, massive amounts of data. And then you just had that little issue of needing to bring it all together and get something, some interesting insights out of <laughs> that little job of pulling it yeah, all together. That, that's a small so, little job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, it used to be though, like we'd spend all our time uh, just with, how hard it was to capture that and store that and connect those. I mean, we, I remember getting in the mid nineties requests from our internal customers um, for data. We're like, you know, you're asking for things that are across three different physical data centers and systems. It's going to take us a while to pull that together and then to query it, the scope of the query, what can we do to bring down the scope of that query? So it doesn't take, seven days to run a single query mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And we don't have uh, you know, those problems in the same way. Um, I know that those still exist. There's still those kinds of queries, but. Um, but mostly, yeah, we don't have those, especially like master data management. That was like a big challenge always when we did the data integration, we had uh, like coming data from different systems, like what you mentioned, and there was no single, let's say, version of truth. So we need to have like, let's say, a few people to take care of like these, this is right, this is not right, this is uh, things like that. So th those are much better implemented these days, but still uh, there are many companies who don't have that. I mean, uh, it's, it's like an ongoing process. Uh, people are adding things into that, which, which is great, but all of these are, let's say, big fundamentals of then having that little analytics at the top. I, is it, it might just be my perception, but people aren't throwing away data anymore. I, I think that's a, um, you know, I, I think again, because of the, it's so inexpensive just to store everything and like, yeah, we don't know what we're going to need later. Um, but uh, are people getting sloppy in their, uh, uh, you know, uh, capture and keeping holding on to data. Yeah, I think because probably because the storage is uh, is not expensive these days. Analytics is expensive. However, like you need servers with like good CPUs, good memories, like uh, or use good software as a service providers. But but the storage. I mean, if you just store things, storage can be also expensive. But if you just store things. 
um, this can't be, let's say, that much expensive. And I, I guess one of the reasons people tend to keep it is that they want to go like 10 years back data and see what they have been doing at that time. Let's yeah. now compare it uh, with the trend that we have now. Well, I guess that's why you, it's, it's good to have people that own to know that data. And so part of that process is, you know what needs to be archived, know what needs to be purged from the system. And, and certainly there's certain data types where they're, uh, there should be expiration dates that can actually be a, um, you know, a, 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 a it can add uh, unnecessary risk to operations ongoing, like by holding on to this this data. Um, there's mm -hmm. you know, a chance that data could uh, you know be lost, or that it could be the wrong data leveraged in where it should be newer and and skew results. I mean, there's a lot of things that the reasons for keeping your data yeah. optimized. Um, mm. but, uh, you know, it's, uh, I know I'm just, I, I'm not working directly within that space anymore. I don't get to have those conversations, keep up kind of where things are. And so again, I just have that, that, uh, that kind of perspective that, um, well, when I, when I got into the Microsoft ecosystem formally, so back in 2005 and, and it, I was, my first MVP was a SharePoint MVP. And so I was in that space. And my observation was that, you know, in the Microsoft world, there really aren't DBAs that the way that, that I had experienced elsewhere and or else they wear different titles. It's just not the same. And so it, it was it was just very different for me. One of the things that I recognized that when Satya became CEO and really started to uh, push the product teams to be more, uh, you know, data centric and decisions they're making about products to understand how the various products were being used. Um, so when you go in and work with a client, I mean, what, what's your conversation with them about uh, optimizing and leveraging that data and being becoming more, you know, data centric in the way that they work? So, um, it, it all starts with, let's say, um, focusing on a specific data analysis scenario, uh, because usually they have like 10 years of data, 15 years of data, some of them like over 20, 30 years of data. And the behavior of, um, and not the just behavior, the way that they store data is kind of different across different years. Yeah. So we'll start with uh, first uh, asking them to like limit that, let's say not to go over all of these data, you can bring them all eventually later on, but let's start with only the latest part that you want to focus on, let's say the last three years, last five years, things like that. Um, let's move that into, let's say a data warehouse structure. And that is the part that usually we get to work with either their internal teams. They might have a team of, let's say developers, uh, like let's say a DBA as well, or even um, a team of, let's say um, software developers. So we'll, we'll work with their team uh, and then uh, provide uh, solutions of, let's say, how this can be implemented. Now this is like the bits and pieces that you can put together uh, and then work on like what type of decisions they want to make. So so usually we work on a, uh, on an outcome basis. Like we want this kind of uh, decision to be made. I want to know like which clients are clients that uh, are, let's say, what are my customer churn rate and what I can do about it. So this can be a good, let's say, example to understand what type of reporting is needed. And based on that reporting, what type of data we should look at. And then those data are coming from all these different systems. Um, there are some obstacles, uh, however, like things such as um, sometimes there is no, let's say, good documentation on the data. Uh, and uh, like you need to find some uh, some subject matter experts within the organization to understand how their data is actually uh, working in that business so that you can convert that requirement to uh, an actual implementation of a BI system. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> your documentation. I was just going to crack a joke <laughs> about, well, like, well, that's rare. I mean, that you don't find documentation. No. Yeah, no, it, uh, yeah, you'll you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of systems without. Let's say, I mean, there are documentations. You'll see documentations on the software developments, but you don't really find 
much of documentations on the database itself. Like yeah. they are using the software as a service, but they don't know how that is stored data. But uh, Or even they are using like an operational system on premises. They just know that this stores the data. They just use the data, but they don't know how the data is stored in that, uh, in that system's database. And that is the part that usually lacks the documentation most. Yeah, no, I, I joke because that's where I started my career. So I was a technical writer and business analyst. Uh, and I spent a lot of time going and documenting, working with engineering teams to document a lot of this because um, it just didn't exist. They're capturing and it, you don't understand what is this? What are you doing? What's being captured? How's this being used? And a lot of that we then iterated on. It was always feedback. So you should also be capturing this for us to be able to leverage this information. Here's what we're missing. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it, I mean, it's a fascinating space. I think that there is, a, I, I think it's been, I mean, it, it, like just a, like data scientists is a, on a lot of top 10 jobs of the future, next 20 years kind of thing. It's, it's like number one or number two across the board. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, every, and quite like, yeah. Uh, quite hot paid jobs as well. All of data science jobs that you see, their salary is quite, <laughs> quite yeah. higher than others. I've got, I've got a son in university who's, uh, he, his major is, his focus is atmospheric sciences. And, and I said, you know, um, you know, he's, he's a, a STEM kid. He's just a math and science whiz. And I said, you know, what you really need to do as a minor, think about uh, looking into data sciences. It's, it's the, the application, everything else that you're doing with your day job, it's the application of the data that you're helping capture and that you're going to go in there and do the analysis on. If you have a fundamental understanding of the capture and manipulation of that data and the visualizations around that, you're going to be so far ahead of all of your peers. And, uh, so he went, he, uh, added that as his minor. Um, so computer science with the data science focus, uh, for his minor, but it's, uh, yeah, that, that's a, if you asked me, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm looking to get into technology, uh, and computer science engineering, uh, it would be, you know, at or near the, the top of my list of recommendations as well of opportunities because every company is becoming, uh, you know, how Satya talked about, you know, every one of the partners, every company is a software company. Hmm. I don't know that I entirely agree with the, with you know, that idea at full. I, I get what he meant. He was talking like business applications and building and hmm. uh, you know citizen development kind of maker type uh, development activities. But I do believe every company across every industry is going to have massive amounts of data and has to be thinking uh, about the you know the the data analysis side of their business. Correct. Yeah, Correct. a lot of. Uh... Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no uh, a lot of uh, a lot of jobs that are not IT related at all, like a finance analyst, like an economist, or like like any types of job that you see, they are at the end of the day dealing with data. They are analyzing that data to achieve some. Um, let's say result and say this is the analysis I made. Let's do something based on that. So something such as data science and uh, predictive analytics, even descriptive analytics. All of these would be helpful for them. So learning yep. these skills is definitely uh, getting them a few steps ahead of others. Well, that's how I got into knowledge management and into the SharePoint space was working in project and portfolio management, and more and more of that job as I started managing teams and building and running PMOs was owning the data across all of these various projects and executives would ask those questions of what are the patterns uh, you know that we were seeing project uh, you know hundreds of projects that are happening across a year how can we get better how, faster cheaper um, do more uh, you know across these are we are we using our people uh, you know uh, in an optimized way, what, what could we learn from this, this information? And it was, it became, you know, a, a massive database of project related data and statistics and looking at it and doing planning activities based on that. So yeah, we, we, we found ourselves in that, that world and I was able to leverage what I'd worked in the data warehousing world over in this project management world and 
then uh, and then found SharePoint and got involved that way. So the rest is history. But well, anyway, well, hey, really, I, I've appreciated your time today and learning about what you what you've been doing. Folks that want to learn more about what you do, get to know you, get in contact. What are the best ways to reach you? Uh, so Radicat website is usually the best place. Uh, there uh, you can find all, let's say, my YouTube, um, um, let's say, videos, my articles, um, and there are like links to Twitter, LinkedIn, everything. All the connection information are there. So Radicat website, uh, like, is uh, has a lot of free materials over there. So lo so go ahead and use those materials and also. If you want to get in touch with me, any questions, I'll be more than happy to help. And, and you've written a few books as well. Yes, yeah, uh, some, some books on Power BI. Uh, and uh, actually one of them is free available in, in the website. So uh, it's like a uh, 1200 pages. It's, it's a little bit like small, but uh, feel free to go and uh, download it. Uh, uh, and uh, there are lots of like Power BI, and, uh, deep technical stuff in it uh, and some other books that you can find it in Amazon, A Press, some other places. Sure. See, as a marketing guy, that's a pretty powerful call to action. Say, visit my website, get a download a free 1200 page book. You're like, well, like, <laughs> whoa, whoa, hey, you know, people like free. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, appreciate Double. your time today and uh, hope to hope to see you in person soon. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Christian. And thank you everyone for watching.